I don't care who you brought to help you. You're never going to get my power. Do I look like I need your power? <laughs> Sonic 2 continues the story of the first movie eight months later, where essentially Sonic the Hedgehog has made himself home on Earth among humans until he's faced with the sudden return of the evil Dr. Robotnik, Surprise, which then leads both sides into a race to find the Chaos Emerald that has the ability to turn you into a draggable sea character. And overall, this movie is proof that we do indeed live in a simulation that follows no logic. Because in this world, we've had movies based on some of the most cinematically and narratively promising video games ever, and yet the best of them are still the ones that are based on this. Did Tails just kill himself? And as much as these Sonic movies piss me off due to my jealousy over Sonic fans getting this and me getting this, I still can't help but applaud the filmmakers for what they've managed to do with this property. Because there's a lot of great stuff here across the board, from very enjoyable character dynamics, to some of the greatest casting of all time, to this movie in general being two hours worth of pleasurable entertainment to distract you from everything else. But the main thing that makes Sonic 2 so special is its origin as a video game. See, just last week, for example, I talked about Uncharted and how it suffered from the negative effects of the infamous video game movie Curse that made it less of a movie and more of a less valuable video game movie. You know, the kind that keeps cinema purists like Mars Scorsese up at night. And now here I am watching Sonic 2, only to see that every one of those negative video game movie aspects that affected Uncharted is handled masterfully. The characters and their relationships, the action pack sequences, the emotional side of things, all of it. You don't need to be a fan of the games to enjoy this movie, and the movie also doesn't just give you less of what you'd get from the games. Hollywood keeps saying it's not possible to escape the video game movie stigma or make my favorite games work as movies, but Sonic keeps proving otherwise. That's simply not possible. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? And so today, let's investigate Sonic 2 through the same video game related aspects as Uncharted and see how it makes them work like a proper movie without the stigma. We've talked about this before, but here's more. Here's a few key ways of how to break the video game movie curse. <laughs> The first key thing to note here is how the movie builds the iconic value of its game characters and relationships rather than rely on their pre-existence from the games. For example, even though Sonic 2 is a sequel, it still doesn't introduce Sonic by just having him show up on screen to say, let's go fast. No, that intro happens through a compelling situation that shows us what it is that makes Sonic Sonic. Essentially, there's a robbery going on that Sonic arrives to stop in a way that highlights him as a character, his abilities, his personality, his core. Overall, whether you've seen the first movie or even heard of the games or not, this introductory situation proves in an entertaining way what makes Sonic special. And this is also the case with the new characters. See, like I mentioned, Sonic's host family has gone on vacation at the start and left him home alone, when the villain from the first movie, Dr. Robotnik, shows up. And this time, he brought company, who we get a proper introduction to. Sonic, meet Knuckles. Do you know the way? Right, so immediately we get a strong sense of what makes Knuckles Knuckles. His physical stature as a brawler, his rock-like personality, his power dynamics with Sonic. I mean, we even get a sense of the inner motive that drives him. What my ancestors could not, to restore the ultimate power to the home of my people. As in, even if you've never seen Knuckles in the games, no worries, because the movie uses this situation to sell the character to you in a very clear and effective way. Same with the other character, Tails. He doesn't just show up to Sonic's doorstep to give boring exposition about himself and what he's doing, because the only value he'd have then is that which he carries from the games. 
No, again, that value is built in the context of the movie through a situation that paints him as a character. He shows up at the last minute to help Sonic. He uses his gadgets to keep them from harm's way. He fanboys out about meeting Sonic and gives exposition while still in the middle of this exciting event. And at the end, he saves them in a way that only he can. Did your butt just turn into a helicopter? <laughs> A blood copter. Full disclosure, I didn't know anything about Tails before this movie. I mean, in the first movie, I got roasted for calling him Yellow Sonic. Like when it introduces this Yellow Sonic from the Sonic universe. <laughs> And yet, having seen him in this introductory sequence, I could already start to understand what is his value as a character from the games. I could understand him as well as his bond with Sonic. And in that way, the same thing also extends to the relationships. We're not supposed to care about the bond between Sonic and Tails here just because, you know, it's Sonic and Tails. Instead, that bond is built throughout the runtime by having them work together to overcome all these obstacles and events. From surviving the initial attack, to playing among us with humans, to having a death off to the death, to supporting each other over similar problematic paths, to saving each other when they need it the most. It's not like in Uncharted where the hero's bond was mostly dependent on the fact that their names happened to be Nate and Sully. Instead, that iconic bond from the games is built very quickly and strongly within the context of this movie. Maybe even a bit too strongly, because at times this little kid's movie starts to feel like something that should be rated R. I mean, as sad as this is to say, this movie builds a stronger bond between the two villains than Uncharted did between the two main heroes. Robotnik and Knuckles are amazing together, because they do all these things side by side, because their strengths patch each other's weaknesses, because their contrasting personalities overall are showcased in such an entertaining way that it's like they were always meant to be. Tiny Magic Hedgehog destroyed. Point is, you cannot rely on the pre-existing value of your game characters and their relationships because most traditional moviegoers will not have any perception of it. Instead, identify what it is that makes those characters and their relationships so iconic and special, and then build that iconic specialty through events and situations to prove it. The second thing to note here is how this movie builds new sequences from the core elements of the games rather than recreate sequences of the games as lesser versions. For example, once Sonic and Tails find the map that will lead them to the Chaos Emerald, Robotnik and Knuckles show up to ruin the fun. Thanks for doing all the hard stuff. Which then leads the heroes to escape down this mountain in a way that begins a very cool set piece that's all about what the games are all about. You know, there's a big underlying emphasis on speed. There's an army of Robotnik's machines on Sonic and Tails' tail. There's a moment where Sonic jumps from one machine to the other with ease. There's Knuckles doing what he tends to do. And then finally, we use Sonic's rings to escape the danger at the last second. As far as my research shows, all these things are inherent parts of the source material, yet the sequence itself doesn't exist in the source material. Like yes, apparently snowboarding is a thing in the Sonic games, but not in this way. There's no sequence in any game where we go to this mountain temple to find this map, and then Robotnik and Knuckles attack, and then we escape down the icy mountainside until Tails gets hurt, and we save him from an avalanche just in the nick of time. You know, it's not like an Uncharted where the sequences as a whole were recreated straight from the games, except as less expansive versions. Very familiar about all this. No, this isn't a recreation as much as a collection of signature elements that unite to form something new. You can only experience this sequence in this movie. And again, as far as I was able to conclude, the same mentality applies to all the major sequences. In the finale, we have the heroes flying on Tails' plane, and we have this massive Robotnik Transformer threatening the town, and we have the Sonic Trinity working as a team for the first time, and we have the Emerald, and we have multiple phases to the boss battle, and we even have Sonic turning into a Super Saiyan.
I assume that all of these things are key elements from the games, yet the sequence as a whole is not. Same with the robbery sequence at the beginning, same with the temple sequence where Robotnik and Knuckles work together to pass all these traps and where Robotnik then pins Knuckles against Sonic until his betrayal is complete and they then have to save each other from drowning. If you're a fan, you're getting something new with the stuff you love without already having seen it. If you're not a fan, you're getting a Sonic experience but in a way that you can't already find in a YouTube walkthrough. By the way, the price of admission is justified, unlike in Uncharted where the sequences in the first two thirds already exist as more expensive versions for free. Very familiar about all this. You give me money! And the reason it is so important to build your set pieces and sequences from these signature game elements is because otherwise, what's the point? For example, there's a section where Sonic and Tails get captured by the humans and then the side characters have to break them out, which at face value has no signature specialty and could exist in any other movie, except that they're using Tails' as gadgets to get past all these guards. So even in the most mundane ordinary sequence, there is still elements of that signature Sonic specialty mixed in, which is very crucial. Because if that signature specialty is not there, if you make a Bioshock movie where the sequences are so ordinary that they could exist in any other movie, then why are you making a Bioshock movie in the first place? You can't just leech off the value of a franchise without utilizing what it is that makes the franchise valuable. And by the way, if you do that with Bioshock Netflix, I will will find you. Point is, use signature elements from the games to build your sequences, but do not just recreate sequences from the games because I shouldn't have to pay for something that already exists. Instead, pull those elements together and offer something new with them. The third key thing here is that even though this is a fun video game movie for little kids, it still isn't only that, but also dares to be emotionally resonant. The first set of Uncharted's issue with this was that a lot of stuff was way too easy and without consequences. Yeah, we should go your way. We should go your way. Whereas here, the journey is full of challenge that takes a toll. Sonic loses to the bad guys right away and only survives because of last minute help. He loses the map to the bad guys and is barely able to escape with his partner's life. He would have drowned if he hadn't convinced Knuckles to see him in new light. You know, not only does Sonic have to save the world, but he also has to maintain the illusion that he's staying at home, after which he also has to worry about humans imprisoning him. I'm not saying we're playing on veteran difficulty here, but there are obstacles big enough that overcoming them can feel satisfying. their ramifications to them as well. When Tails gets injured at the mountain, he doesn't just immediately get back up. No, we have to save him just in time and then he stays injured for the next 20 minutes. When Sonic's lie about staying home as promised is exposed, it's not just okay. No, that broken promise leads to him and his friends getting captured. When Robotnik gets the emerald, it's not like, well, now he just has the treasure. No, he can use it to build this transformer and destroy Sonic's town. Overall, just because this movie is about an unreal hedgehog, doesn't mean his journey can't have real life repercussions to make it feel real. But the most important side of this is that, in general, the movie isn't afraid of negative emotion like Uncharted. If you look at the motivations behind the main journey, for example, you can find real resonating issues on both sides. With Knuckles, we gradually learn that he was a part of this tribe that was wiped out in a war for the Emerald. He said, my moment to honor our tribe would come. Those were the last words he spoke to me. Which has left him with this obsessive goal to secure the emerald because he's the only one left to fulfill that goal and honor his fallen people. All this may be very simple, but the point is that Knuckles has this inner flaw that defines him in an understandable negative way. He doesn't laugh, he doesn't enjoy things, he's just a slave to this weight on his shoulders. And it's not until the very end that he grows past this flaw and manages to value the fun in life. Ah, ah, ah. I am having the fun. What is ice cream? A journey which we can feel and relate to. Whereas with Sonic, it's the mirror image of this. He was raised by this protector of the emerald who gave her life for him. Goodbye, Sonic. No! 
And so now he's not only out to save the world, but to also make her proud. I'm not saying there wasn't more you could have done with that, but I am saying that Sonic is scarred and flawed over this stuff enough that it still visibly affects his everyday life. As baffling as it sounds, we can perceive more emotion in this blue hedgehog missing this owl than we can in Nathan Drake missing his brother. point is, you need negativity to emotionally ground your movie. I understand the notion that video game movies are for younger audiences and thus should be fun. Like, why waste time on preachy moments like this? And right now, whether you want to hear this or not, you are still just a kid. Oh my god. You got some more growing up to do before you're ready to be the big hero. But the truth is, without negativity, there is no positivity. We're not gonna care about Sonic and Knuckles and Tails coming together if you don't first explore how all of them in their own ways are affected by loneliness. We're not gonna care about Sonic saving his host family if we don't first explore them being a family and how heroism isn't about stopping the crime as much as about protecting others from the crime. Overall, positive emotion means nothing if you don't contrast it with negative emotion. If your movie is only fun, it's just gonna be an emotional flatline. And I think the main issue with this genre is that Hollywood is run by these old people whose only experience of video games come from seeing two walls whacking a pixel around. They view games as these fun dumb things, so why should the movies be any different? You know, the comic book movie genre wasn't cracked for the mainstream until years down the line when just the right people showed up to crack it. So in that sense, movies like Sonic that can escape the stigma are probably gonna keep being rare for now. But in 10 to 15 years, when you guys are running all these studios, it'll be different. It's a negative video game movie world today, but it'll be positive tomorrow. And then we'll know to value it.